Hey, Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar. We continue to feature the works of authors we know and love through readings, discussions, and forums, moving into the summer season and beyond. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to take this moment to acknowledge those who have come before us as stewards of the land and give an offering of respect. Tonight on City Lights Live, we're delighted to have with us Kay Ming Chang, celebrating the publication of her new collection of short fiction titled Gods of Want. It's published by One World Books that do just some amazing, amazing stuff. We're very, very, very huge fans of their work. Uh, Kay Ming Chang is a Kundaman Fellow, a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. She is the author of the acclaimed novel Bestiary, a New York Times book review editor's choice, which was long listed for the Center of Fiction First Novel Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award, as well as the Lambda Literary Award. So tonight's event is being co-sponsored by the Asian American Writers Workshop, which is a national literary nonprofit dedicated to publishing and incubating works by Asian and Asian diasporic writers, poets, and artists. Since their founding in 1991, they provided a countercultural literary art space that's at the intersection of migration, race, and social justice. So to find out more about their good work, we'll be posting links in the chat function with which you can learn more about them. Joining Kay Ming Chang tonight in conversation is Lily Philpot of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Lily has played a vital role in the literary community for many years, having served in the role of literary programs and World Voices Festival producer at PEN America. She is currently programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, where she curates and produces public programs and oversees the margins and open city fellowships and the Create Now Writers in the Schools program. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, Violet Cooper Smith with us. Regretfully, uh, she's experienced a last minute family emergency, which prevented her from being with us tonight. So we wish her and her family our best and apologize to all of you for the change in the program. So to open the evening, I'd like to welcome Lily Philpot. Please join us now in offering a warm welcome to both her and Kay Ming Chang. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you so much for this intro, Peter. I'm so energized. I'm so excited to be here to chat. Um, huge thanks to Peter and everyone at City Lights for hosting this, for making this uh, virtual event space possible. Um, I'm speaking to you all from Brooklyn, New York. I'm on ancestral and unceded Canarsi and Muncie Lenape land. Um, I did want to just really quickly show everyone what Violet Cooper Smith's book looks like. So you can grab it at City Lights or your local indie bookstore. It's called Build Your House Around My Body. It is incredible. Um, and again, all of our, our thoughts are with Violet and her family. Um, I also wanna just really quickly thank Carla and the team at One World who, as Peter said, are absolutely amazing. A shepherd just the most incredible books into the world, including Gods of Want, which we'll talk about this evening. Um, I also just wanted to briefly gush about Kaming, who I was thinking about recently. We speak about Kaming in terms, honestly, of like myth and legend at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, I think it's true that we publish your first poems in the margins, our literary magazine, when you were 16 is what I've often been told. And here we are celebrating the publication of your second book, which just feels so incredibly special. Um, and I hope you know that you are just a legend in the pantheon of the Asian American Writers Workshop. So I'm really excited to chat with you. Um, and I wanted to just kind of get straight into it. and. There is so much in this story collection. It is so beautiful. And I thought maybe we could start with structure of the book. So the stories are divided into three sections. The sections are titled Mothers, Myths, and Moths, which I love. And would love to hear you talk about how that structure came to be, how those section titles came to be, um, and how you decided sort of what fit where. Yeah, I love that question so much. And, and thank you for that introduction as well. I believe the myths are, are factually true <laughs> um, in terms of my relationship to Asian American Writers Workshop and my book launch as well um, was held with you all. So it feels, uh, again, such a it's always such a full circle moment to, to be doing events um, 
in partnership with AWW. So it's very exciting for me. Uh, but yeah, the structure of the book actually, um, it happened kind of fairly late in the editorial process, which was really terrifying because I was like, oh, I, on the micro level, on the word and sentence and language level, uh, I feel a sense of like internal knowledge that I can follow and that guides and leads me. But on the macro level, in terms of things like structure and what stories will even be included in the book, I felt mm -hmm. I, that I had no internal guide <laughs> for that. So it was really terrifying for a while where I was, I kept swapping stories in the manuscript. I kept kind of back and forth with the editor, not being very sure. Um, and what ended up happening is I, I decided to think to return to those micro units of language um, because I, I, I felt, oh, those are the touchstones for me. That's what my writing revolves around. And so I ended up making a list of all of these words that recur in the manuscript um, and they all were M words. And I did not intend that. <laughs> I did not, I did not purposefully only pull out words that started with an M, but there were a lot of myths and moons and mothers and mobs and melons. Um, and there's a story with a character named Mariella. There were all in all of these M words. Um, and so I ended up creating that list and then realizing that all of the stories kind of gravitated around um, those words. And for a while I had five sections. I also had um, moons and mouths because um, there are also a lot of those. Um, uh, and I realized that there was something really mythologically resonant about the triptych um, and about the number three. Like I remember I grew up reading a lot of Greek mythology where, you know, there are th three fates and three theories and um, God's kind of appearing in three. And so I felt like the triptych was right and that all of the stories ended up organizing themselves around one of these three words. Um, mm. And that even without intending, I was like, okay, if I write down these three words and then I just instinctively look at a story and place it under mothers, myths, or mobs, what will happen? And I ended up with three almost exactly evenly, um, uh, uh, three even, like almost three exact amount of pages. <laughs> like it was like 50 pages in one, 50 pages in the other, and 50 pages in the last section, completely unintentionally. Um, and the number of stories in each was different. So I was like, okay, there's some kind of fate <laughs> that has been conspiring along with me um, and something subconsciously that has been working around this triptych. And I just needed to find that number and return to the language um, and let that continue to guide me. Um, and that ended up help, helping to solve the really big, big picture question. <laughs> yeah. That's so fascinating I never would have guessed that in a million years like I think I I really read it assuming that you had those headings and kind of wrote into them so that is fascinating to hear that it was almost like a, a command f moment in the manuscript to pull out these words and then do the section headings um I also love what you said about these like micro units of language and want to ask you about that like internal knowledge you had of the worlds that you were building on the page, which are so just lush and visceral and so fascinating. And I'd love to hear you talk about like how you approach world building, but world building specifically from like a sensory place, because there is so much of like, I just like touch and like licking and smelling and tasting and I love it. And I, I would love to hear like, how do senses play into the worlds you build? Oh, I love that question. Uh, and I love thinking about world building because I feel like to me, and I feel like I say it a lot, but mythology is, is about world building and creating the rules of a world. And um, because I'm so drawn to mythology, I always think about world building on some scale, like even at the space of a kitchen or a domestic space, I think about that as a world. Um, and like who comes in and out of this kitchen, who tells what stories, who gossips, that to yeah. me is a, a complete world. Uh, yeah, and I think with sensation, yeah, I think I, I tend to be very interested in the body um, and just like the porousness of, of existing in a space. Um, mm -hmm. And how for a lot of the characters in the story, there's kind of a symbiotic relationship between a character and other characters or a character in their environment. Um, so there's always this feeling that, you know, like the weather enters someone's body or someone's body enters the weather in some way and that there's a fluidity between what we consider like an external environment and an internal environment an internal environment. And so in that way, I guess world building also applies to the ways that I think about writing the body too, um, as its own world um, yeah. and kind of carrying its own mythology and rules for itself and possibilities. 
Um, and I think that really helps me think about writing expansively about, mm. um, yeah, about settings and, and also characters <clears throat> and kind of en encompassing all these different elements. Yeah, I, I want to ask you actually to follow up on that about the body, about porosity to the natural world, because in Bestiary as well in your first novel, there is so much exchange between the human body, often it's like a, a girl's body, a woman's body, and the natural or animal world. Um, in Bestiary, the main character grows a tail and sort of deals with that along with so much more. Um, but there's so much of that too. Um, and how does that sort of exchange, that porosity, how does it help you access your characters in a mm. deeper way? And maybe actually, I know there's a lot of questions, but tacking on as well, for this collection, it seems like there's a lot of transformation into fish or into sort of aquatic animals. Um, and is that like a certain, you know, category of animal that you were drawn to in terms of that exchange and that porosity? Oh, I love that you noticed that. Um, <laughs> Because I was like, oh, there are a lot of fish um, okay. and, and transformations into fish. Yeah. I was like, oh, maybe it, it was just my childhood fantasy of becoming a mermaid. That was always such an exciting um, thing to me. <laughs> I was completely that person in like a bathtub, like flapping my legs, pretending it was a tail. Um, yeah, I think for me, that porosity really frees up the language. And I find that because it frees up the language that I can use to describe things or to kind of understand the interiority or explore the interiority of a character, it brings a certain kind of, um, I don't know, almost like whimsy or, um, I don't know if whimsy is the right word, but uh, possibility and um, surprise, I think, maybe that's just the word, um, surprise to when I'm writing about a character. Because I find when my language feels really freed up, um, where it feels like anything is within reach, um, you know, fish, <laughs> uh, other other species, um, trees, the environment, um, history, memory, all of these things are like accessible within um, this character's consciousness or um, within yeah. the language. I find that I'm able to um, write these characters in ways that surprise me and I can't always determine exactly what they're gonna do or gonna say. So I feel like it then all arises from a more subterranean place where it's not really necessarily my, my conscious mind like controlling um, the character, but that there is something that consistently rises to the surface that's really unexpected. I'm like, oh, I didn't expect to go there. Lots of fish. <laughs> um, or I didn't expect this transformation to happen. I didn't expect this metaphor. Because um, I think for me, transformation that happens very literally um, always begins with language. Um, and, uh, and with metaphor, it's oftentimes like turning a metaphor literal or, or um, exploring and seeing how this metaphor can continue to like metamorphosize and change and flip. Um, and that kind of leads me to what literally happens um, in the story. Um, and I think that language is this material that I, I have a lot of fun playing with. Um, and then about the fish too. I, I, I think something that I was really consciously thinking about, especially in stories, um, like dikes, which takes place in a drought. Um, I was thinking a lot about how there are these like two landscapes that dominate a lot of what the characters dream about and think about the landscape of Taiwan, which is this island that is so watery <laughs> and lots of flooding and rains and humidity and wetness. And then California, which is um, drought and dryness and a certain kind of deprivation of water. And I remember wanting to hold that contrast and think about what could emerge from this, like these two, um, I don't know, consciousnesses and sources of memory that have such radically different relationships to water and um, like how do the characters internalize that and um, what are their relationships to water? Um, and that kind of ended up being something that I was interested in exploring. Yeah, I actually, this is making me want to go slightly off script from the questions. <laughs> That's okay, because actually something I had been thinking a lot about while reading the collection that I didn't include a question on because I hadn't quite developed my thoughts. So I just want to hear your thoughts on it was this idea of like the burgeoning genre of 
climate fiction. Um, and actually specifically with the story Dykes, which is about a drought, but also a flood and um, trash pollution in the city. I think it's mm. this story where there are raccoons swimming through a flooded, yeah. like, like on a boat of trash essentially, which is this amazing, amazing image. Um, but hearing you talk even about, I mean, about the, the contrast between Taiwan and California, talking about water, but the language you're using too about your writing and what is emerging from this subterranean place. Um, I don't know if this is like a fully formed question yet, but I'm interested to hear if you like associate your writing as you're doing it with um, wanting it to be sort of like environmentally focused if you think about like writing about climate disaster um, mm. into your stories and how that might play a role. Yeah, I, I think I, it, it's almost, it, it is this very subterranean thing because I think consciously I'm super intimidated and scared about um, like labeling something that I write or I'm trying to write as climate fiction because I always feel like, oh, there's a certain amount of authority maybe that comes with that, that I don't feel mm -hmm. like I've done the work to earn. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, that's kind of dangerous too because then that's kind of assuming that unless you have this like specific, what in my mind is like, oh, someone perfect to write climate fiction, then somehow no one else can be included in that. But in reality, um, it's all of our inheritance. And so I feel like I'm still kind of navigating that and kind of figuring out my own relationship to that and what my own kind of preconceived ideas of who can write climate fiction are about um, and how that I don't know, it might be a product of, of what I've consumed or my image of someone who is an authority and things like that. Um, yeah. But I do remember I, I was writing a flash fiction piece unrelated to this book, but kind of in tandem because I, I think a lot about rain and either the absence or presence of rain. And I remember mm -hmm. I was writing this flash fiction story um, about in the collective voice of these girls. And they were saying things like, oh, you know, rain used to be imported into this city, but now they only you know import glitter and so the glitter kind of sprinkles down instead of rain and that's been used to replace rain and i just remember so much like capitalist language coming up in the way that these girls were talking about rain um mm. and i was like oh this is really <laughs> this is really indicative <laughs> um of like controlling you know water and what has caused drought and things like that. And I was like, oh, so there's something here that I have internalized and that also my characters have internalized and I shouldn't be afraid um, to lean into that. Because um, especially thinking about inheritance, um, I'm really interested in inherited language um, and what languages we have inherited to talk about things like the environment and our bodies um, and, and just so many things. Um, and so, yeah, I think it does in some way <laughs> uh, fit or um, is something I'm digesting. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's sort of what I was picking up on a little bit as well. Not this like, you know, polemic on global warming, but a bit more on like in the fish that they need to die because the fish is not a certain color. And that maybe mm. is not related to climate change, but is also I think we can kind of trace it back to what is happening in the oceans and, and mm. all of that. Um, but yeah, going back to craft, this sort of subterranean place that you've talked about that you access and then it surprises you in, in your writing and your characters, I'd love to hear about your process, like what it looks like when you come to the page each day or each every other day, whatever it is. Um, are there like particular writing exercises that help you access that place when you are stuck or that really like opened up a character or a story to you in ways that you didn't expect? Yeah, I find that for me, I think maybe this comes from um, me like kind of writing in the poetry space and again, being really interested in the micro, but I found that what has really unlocked so much of, so many of the stories have actually been thinking about the flash fiction form um, and almost like writing independently of the stories. And by doing so, by moving away from them, I actually find my way back to them. Um, so the kind of like very faded incident that I'm like, there was some kind of intervention. 
uh, yeah. in this process was um, I, there were two stories I was really, really struggling with. I think it was Noir and Dykes. And um, I, the, I, I remember I was um, talking to my editor, Nicole Counts, and we kind of both agreed that structurally these stories needed bigger edits compared to the other stories. And we were sending them back and forth. And I remember I was sitting on those stories for a long time and just feeling incredibly discouraged um, and just feeling like, I think I've said what I've said with these stories and they're just not working. But I was mourning already the idea of having to let them go and taking them out of the collection. Um, so I remember I was like, okay, I'll just sit on them for a couple of weeks and just see what happens. And then I think maybe a month and a half went by and um, I, I hadn't written for a while. And I was like, okay, well, I know that I have the flash fiction form to return to because it's this, this space where, again, it feels like experimentation is possible. Language can be really expansive. Um, and there's also you know, an end in sight. <laughs> um, and I'm really interested in the micro stories. Um, and so I ended up writing two consecutive flash pieces. And I looked at them for a while. They were like in different tenses, um, different POVs to anything I'd written in the, in the collection. And I looked at them and I was like, hmm, the character names are different, but mm -hmm. I think these are the two exact pieces that I needed for these two stories. And I ended up copy pasting the first one and putting it in one of the stories and copy and pasting the second one and putting it in the next, in the, in the second story. And I almost didn't change them at all in terms of edits besides like adjusting tense and point of view and names. Um, yeah. And it was so shocking to me. I was like, <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. It's almost like, you know, when you find something in a dream, like, or you go to bed with like a problem or something you lost, and then it happens in the dream and you wake up and it, it's actually that in real life. It's, it's so yeah. uncanny. And it's almost terrifying. And it, there was part of me, I was like, I almost wish that didn't happen. That's <laughs> scary. <laughs> but I don't know. I think I started to have appreciation for the mis mystery of the writing process. And I think oftentimes we want to really demystify the process, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. But I think allowing for some sense of the unexpected and seeing what happens on the page that day and giving yourself the space to kind of dream um, outside of the structure of like a project, a book, a mm -hmm. story, a poem um, allows for all of these really mysterious and like serendipitous things to happen and, and realizations, at least for me, that's always been really helpful. Yeah. Can you actually talk a little bit more about like what editing those stories was like and shout out to Nicole Counts who's yeah. um, yeah. your editor like as you kind of had those flash pieces that you were I'm imagining you like doing surgery like sewing them <laughs> into the existing stories like I feel like that's a little bit and I do want to both embrace the magic of the writing process but demystify too that kind of ugly piece of like how do you make sure the tenses fit and that the names work and like it's mm. obvious that it was or it's not obvious that they were written at different times like what did that kind of final editing process look like yeah I think it it was a matter of um once I found the place that it needed to be in I think it all kind of naturally because there was also something open-ended about the splash pieces that kind of indicated to me that they didn't stand alone um there was some kind of like internal drive in them that felt like they were uh, part of the same world, I think. Um, and then once I found its place, I, I found that things kind of come together. And it's really funny because I love to make things harder for myself. <laughs> so I love to like use time in ways that make it more difficult for myself and tense and point of view. And I often think like, oh, I actually could in some ways, uh, simplify certain big picture things that really allow me to revel in the intricacies of like the smaller things and the language. Um, so that's what I'm trying to find in my own balance. And it's something I'm still discovering because right now I'm still like intricate, big picture, intricate, small picture, intricate, medium <laughs> picture, just intricacy <laughs> everywhere. Um, yeah. And, and I think overall the editing of these stories was just learning to embrace um, in some ways, the connectedness of them. Like there are a couple moments of like very deliberate connection, but, uh, but I guess in the thematic way, like learning to embrace that, okay, these are the stories that I'm writing now. They might not be the most kind of contemporary things on my mind um, and the most indicative of my present writing, but mm. 
they're, they're in conversation with each other and they belong together in this collection. And it's something that's separate from my writing life now. I think it was really difficult for me to do that because I was constantly like, I want to write brand new stories, <laughs> swap yeah. three fourths of them out, put in <laughs> the brand new stories because I just wrote it and I'm excited about it. Um, and so I was, I, it was for me, um, learning to like, learning to be in tune with a past self almost in order to revise. Yeah, oh, I love that. And I really, I'm hoping that you wrote stories that you've saved in a folder so that we can read more collections in the future. <laughs> that is important selfishly to me. Um, I wanna ask you about one of my favorite topics in writing, which is myth and magic. And you sort of started talking about it already, but like, I have a sort of a lot of questions about both of this. I'm interested in kind of mythic frameworks of stories. And as you're saying, maybe that's a way to kind of decrease the intricacy of a story. If you have a, a, a myth that has been told so many times that you can work within. Um, but I'm also just so interested in how you use, I don't even know if magic is quite the right word, maybe just like transformation or a transfiguration, but how you use that to access elements of, you know, place, character, history, trauma, um, family, all of that, how you access that so deeply. And when you are kind of wielding that magic in the stories, these transformations, what are the rules? Like, is there a boundary that you cannot cross at which point it's too far? Or is it just like no holds barred, anything is possible? And then how do you kind of stop it from like running away with itself? Um, yeah. That's such a great question because it's one that I think I, my revision brain is always like, okay, pay attention. <laughs> um, yeah, prioritize. Um, but yeah, I think for me, uh, I, well, firstly, I love using the structures of other stories and existing stories um, yeah. because I think structurally, I don't have an awareness. <laughs> um, I, I am always hyper-focused on the language and as I said, on the micro unit. And so to me, I deeply, deeply enjoy um, Wikipedia pages of myths, uh, Wikipedia pages of like Grimm's fairy tales, of origin stories, um, anything where you see that like <laughs> classic three paragraph uh, summary of something because yeah, I really enjoy um, pulling from those structures. And, and to me, it's, it's not only a way of um, like letting myself then uh, really revel in the language, but there's also just something like a kind of childlike wonder about listening to myths and inherited stories and these structures that should seem really familiar and just like completely um, that, that we're desensitized to. But to me, it always brings me to a place of, of um, almost to like my origin of love of loving storytelling. And so I feel like each time I write about a myth, um, I'm constantly returning to my origin for my love of writing. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it allows me, I think, to, to keep going and to keep generating and to be excited um, all the time. Yeah, and in terms of magic um, or transformation, I really love the idea of, of like rather than magic, transformation or even imagination because I think there's something about transformation or imagination that's like it comes from the interior whereas when I think of magic I also think of like external systems like where the magic is sourced from yeah the, yeah, the rules of a world or or conceptually and I think for me I'm really interested in writing kind of magic that comes from an interior that comes from imagination um and like I said before of of like a metaphor becoming literal um, or a metaphor continuing to, sh to shape shift um, or to recur in a character's life. Um, I love the moments where the, the metaphor is like one sentence in a line, but then it consumes the whole story. And there's a story in here in a flash story called Eating Pussy where it's kind of like that, um, where like the metaphor of the story kind of becomes the story and it becomes the world. Um, and I love that feeling of, of um, recurrence, I think, is something that I'm really interested in. Um, words and phrases and metaphors coming coming back again and again. And maybe that's kind of spell-like or trance-like or part of the, the transformation or imagination. But for me, I think rhythm is also a kind of magic. Yeah, 
that idea of recurrence and rhythm is really making me think about um, about myth and fairy tale and I have similarly done some real deep dives into world mythology on Wikipedia, which is, I love um, fairy tales. I love origin myths. I, I think I love fairy tales, particularly because of the like inevitability of the story. I love that like, there is always gonna be, you know, an old woman by a well and a <laughs> three brothers or seven brothers and the youngest brother is gonna do something. And um, I'm curious just on that sort of idea of like, which myths you might take to mold and change or like just totally flip on their heads like what kind of stories or what kind of myths really strike you as being like there's a spark there that you want to like mm. fan into a flame or like tear apart entirely mm. and like use that structure yeah i love that you mentioned archetypes archetypes because i find out that i i with a lot of characters i love to play really deliberately with archetypes of like yeah the the wizard the witch <laughs> um the helpful the helpful deity um I really like to explicitly play with those things because I think um I think it, it, there is this human impulse but then also there is something so deeply pleasurable about um yeah playing with the with the, with these archetypes and seeing the ways we can kind of um dissolve or protect or maintain or withhold um but yeah, I think for me, because there are so many myths and fairy tales that I love so dearly. And then sometimes I'm like, why, why am I never writing about them? <laughs> I'm like, why? Like, I love these stories. And yet I don't really have an impulse, at least right now, to write about them. Um, and I think it's because it, the ones that I end up writing about are so unexpected to me. They're often ones that I don't even know that thoroughly. Like, there are some that I know very thoroughly, but they tend to be ones where I have like misremember, like I mis misremember parts of it, or I I heard it from from this person in this very um, mysterious circumstance or kind of noteworthy circumstance, or mm -hmm. oh that's all I remember about this person is them telling me this story. So mm -hmm. it's oftentimes something that feels more like a seed rather than a like a fully um, full full fully grown flower tree. <laughs> metaphors on the spot um because I find that when it's something that I, I have like already really thoroughly researched already have heard maybe um many many times in a way where it feels like this like object I've turned around and around in my hand um it's so fully formed that mm -hmm. for me like entering it and playing with it it feels like a familiar space and I think I am drawn to those myths where it's like, okay, there's something, there's some mystery in it that yeah. I want to pull at, or like it's a thread that I want to keep tugging and see what unravels. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's not even like direct conflict with the myth or this like direct desire to subvert. Um, it's, it's usually like a, did I remember that correctly? Or a certain amount of doubt or uncertainty that um, makes me kind of, makes me want to lean in. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's so fascinating to think about. Um, it's making me think through all of the like half remembered fairy tales I have. Yeah. Made, which I love. Um, yeah. Before I ask my next question, I just want to quickly flag that we'll do an audience Q&A in maybe 10 minutes. If anyone has questions, put them in the chat um, so that I don't monopolize all of Kaming's time, although I very easily could. Um, <laughs> but I do want to ask about the people in our lives who are storytellers. And I want to mm. relate this, if I can, to your short story, Auntie Land, which mm. I really loved. Um, this idea is actually something we've talked about a bit at the workshop, this idea of like a coalition or a community mm. of aunties who hold us up and get us through everything. They help us survive. Um, you know, they keep everything together. And I'd love to hear you speak about like that kind of maternal wisdom, but kind of more specifically like auntie wisdom that, or like auntie lineage that keeps the community together um, and how it might influence as well your stories that are about like immigration, diaspora, finding roots in a new place, um, following a relocation or removal, et cetera. Yeah, I, I feel like I was really interested in I realized when I started Auntland, I was at first thinking really literally about a character and their aunts. 
And I realized as the stories kind of spiraled out, I was really interested in like the transience of, of being an aunt or an auntie or a maternal figure and thinking about, I don't know, that there is this kind of permanent collective of aunties, but it's always ambiguous within the story whether Oh, are they are they liter are they related in a literal sense? Is this a neighbor? Is this a teacher? Is this someone in their community? Um, mm -hmm. Is this an elder? Is this aunt younger? Because um, I've also had you know aunts younger and older than me, um, and so I I was really interested in also yeah in the transience of that role, but how permanent it can feel that their relationships have been shaped by care, um, and that will always there will always be like a tether between them, but that this narrator and these aunts are kind of also passing in and out of each other's lives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just thinking about like, oh, how many people have been these aunts or aunties in my life and the variety of roles that they have taken in the ways that we have cared for each other um, and also the ways in which um, we, even as our relationship has shifted or changed, there is some kind of like underlying network of care um, that I think I'm really interested in. Um, that again, that isn't defined by familial relationships as we kind of typically understand them or sanction them. I was like, oh, I like this. I like this idea of um, that that there could be an aunt who is like totally unknown to you, but you do this one thing for each other, um, or this aunt who. Uh, you know really intimately and but you moved out of their neighborhood like I don't know all of those different forms <laughs> of yeah. being an auntie and of caretaking and of intimacy I think was really interesting yeah. for me yeah I think that's so beautiful and is so expressed in that story and in others too this really expansive view of what it means to be an auntie and do not need to be related you know biologically but will always kind of be there for like you know, tough love or a meal, <laughs> a ride, whatever you need. Um, I love that. Um, I have a couple more questions. I wanted to read briefly just the dedication, which is the first thing I saw when I opened the book, obviously. Yeah. Um, the book is for Amy, Anina, Kyle, and Pixlin, who I believe are your writing group. Um, yes. Kyle and Pixlin, I know, are incredible writers. Um, I love that this is dedicated to your writing group and would love to just hear like who this book is for, if that's something you can define. And also, you know, who held you up while you were writing it, your writing group, your editor and, and beyond? Yeah, I love this question so much because I love to gush about my writing group and how transformative it has been for me to have found them. Um, and it's so funny because we're called writing group, but we spend the majority of our time not writing and not talking about writing, <laughs> which I love so much. It's like writing group asterisk, except nothing to do with writing. Um, <laughs> no, we have something to do with writing. But what I love is that we, we're all located in these different places. Speaking of like diaspora and um, thinking about a network of care. But even as we're far from each other, we find each other where we are. So you know, like Kyle will send me a photo of seeing my book, you know, in a local bookstore. And, you know, I will text picture and like, oh, I heard, I saw someone reading your book. Like we, we managed to find each other in our disparate places, um, which I find is now very thematically resonant with this book. Um, and also because a lot of this book, they, they actually did read in writing group, um, probably at least like four of these stories, four or five of these stories. And it was in that space that I realized the value in writing for this specific small group of people, of writing for the people you want to write for, of writing for your friends, um, of really bringing care to the work in a way that I'd never felt before in any setting. Um, it was always this feeling of, um, yeah, I think previously I was treating like, oh, the idea of giving feedback, there's this very utilitarian way. And um, it was just so incredible that we could like begin to see um, like our lives backgrounding these stories in a way, like we were allowed to exist as people and our lives were allowed to fully occupy the space along with our writing. And I just never felt that before because in classes, typically you don't have much space for the life, <laughs> but you have a lot of space for the writing and like talking about plot and character. 
Um, so it was that space where I was like, oh, my writing, my life, there's this integration and these relationships too. It's all fully integrated and each is so present and foregrounded. Um, and I just had never felt that before. And they're also just writers who I would, I'm just constantly <laughs> so amazed by and inspired by and just enamored with. Um, yeah, so it's been, it's been, speaking of transformative experiences, very transformative. Well, I love that so much. That's so sweet. And it's actually making me think I did an event with the AAWW on Tuesday with the author Jamil John Kochai, and we asked him who his first readers were. And mm. he actually said his siblings, that he has a group chat with his siblings. And it was the same thing of like they'll they'll like tell it like it is if needed, <laughs> but also like they know the stories, they know who he's writing about, they love him and they're there in support and just is so sweet. I loved seeing that dedication to to the the people who like helped mm. you if you were writing is so so lovely. Um, one more question, and then I want to do a quick rapid fire round. Um, Ooh, yes, push That's it exciting. up a little bit. <laughs> and then if any audience members have questions, please let us know. Um, I actually just wanted to ask you really quickly about the cover of the book, which is so beautiful. Um, you actually were sharing with Peter and I before we let everyone into the Zoom that. To, to show this gorgeous um, painting, I believe. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, the artist, the meaning behind it? Um, and also just remember what this looks like as you go to buy it, <laughs> et cetera, things like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited because I love this cover so, so much. And it's um, the cover art is designed, or the cover jacket is designed by Grace Hahn. And um, the, the nine-headed bird, it's a nine-headed bird. <laughs> bird. I feel like I probably should have prefaced with that, that it is a bird. Um, and it ha has this like multicolored roost, peacock roost, rooster-esque tail um, and has nine heads. Um, and this illustration is actually um, a Qing dynasty illustration from a compendium of birds and beasts. Um, so it is an actual representation <laughs> of a nine-headed bird um, that has then been kind of resized um, for this cover. Um, and I love the like flame feathers um, coming out of the different, out of the lettering. I love the, I love how they're both feathery and <laughs> flamey. Um, yeah. It feels very apt for the book. Uh, but yeah, the nine headed bird is one of the creatures that I wrote about. Um, and that really fascinated me because it's actually a 10 headed bird, but the 10th head is severed. So it's perpetually bleeding. Um, perpetually wounded and it's known as the nine headed bird despite having this like severed 10th head. And a lot of this book is about absence and loss and um, rituals around, around loss um, and the presence of that loss. So it's like, oh, really interesting to name this bird a nine headed bird when it is in fact carrying this like phantom sibling head. Um, mm -hmm and is also like perpetually possibly bleeding. Um, so I thought there was some resonance with that image and it was something that was really, really haunting me. Um, and so it ended up feeling very resonant, I think for the book as a whole. Amazing. I literally, I hadn't noticed the lettering with the like feathers. And oh feathers. yeah, <laughs> it's right pretty now. amazing, yeah. And you said the artist's name is Grace Hahn. Yes. Um, so yeah, the cover jacket design is Grace Hunt. And then the bird itself, um, again, is an illustration from the Qing Dynasty. And I believe it's not credited because I think it's the oldest um, existing illustration of a nine-headed bird, um, which I love that there's an oldest existing illustration of a nine-headed bird. That's so incredible. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for sharing. That's really, that's so special to learn. Of course. Um, yeah, okay, so rapid fire round and then we'll do some audience Q&A or I will ask more questions until the end of the hour, which I think is <laughs> cute. Um, so yes, I say rapid fire if you want to explain further, you're totally welcome, but mm. questions. Um, if you could describe your book, Gods of Want, with just one verb, which ver verb would you use? Uh, flock, to flock. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Okay. Um, when you're writing longhand or typewritten drafts? Uh, typewritten. My brain is too fast for my extremely slow hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then related to that, what's your favorite place to write? Mm. This immediately is not a place, but the first thing that I thought of is like an orientation. <laughs> 
Um, and that I really enjoy writing on my stomach. And this has been a thing since I was a child. I don't know if it was like my childhood desire to also be a cat and a mermaid and all the things, but yeah, I find something very comforting about like lying on my belly or lying on my stomach and being like horizontal. It also causes me to fall asleep a lot, but <laughs> that is like the orientation in which I do most things. <laughs> Okay. I love that. In like a sunbeam, like a cat. Yes, like, exactly. Ideal. Very that, ideal. That. Yeah. Um, I actually have a sort of follow-up question that I didn't include here, but what is your favorite time to write? Mm. I feel like my favorite time is also the time that I try to avoid because it always ends up throwing off my sleep cycle to a point that is difficult to recover from, but I love to write at like 11 p.m. <laughs> I love that feeling of when all the mirrors are, sorry, all the windows turn into mirrors because it's so dark outside and that feeling of being really alone. Um, but I'm trying not to do that anymore. <laughs> oh, it's almost the witching hour. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. The ghosts are here, you know, the veil between the worlds is thin. <laughs> I can see that, I can see that. Um, if we were all in person at City Lights, what was your fav what is your favorite post-event food? What would you lead mm. us to? Wow, I will say maybe it's also probably my favorite pre-event food, non-event food, <laughs> uh, but I would say Korean fried chicken. Yeah. That sounds delicious. <laughs> um, and then finally, if you were a ghost, who would you haunt? Mm. Oh, this is such a good question. I feel like I would want to, <laughs> my first thought was I want to haunt with like the crows and the neighborhood birds. <laughs> Like, I would just love to have them just like start cacophonously singing <laughs> um, on various roofs and branches. So the neighborhood birds. Oh, I love that. That sounds wonderful. Um, and yeah, I see there is one question in the chat um, or a couple of questions. Ooh, so let me read those. Um, so from Kurt, hi everyone. I was wondering if teaming found any stories particularly difficult to finalize and why? Yeah, there definitely were. And it was those two stories that I ended up writing these separate flash pieces for. Um, and I think it's all, for me, it's always structure. Um, it's, I always am never quite sure what the shape of the story will be. Um, I have these like various accumulated elements, but um, I just find that the, yeah, the shape of it is, has not yet emerged. Um, yeah, and, and then I find again, similarly to before, that returning to the really small units um, uh, of language or even looking at a paragraph, like sometimes it'll really help me to isolate a paragraph th of the story and kind of see the movement within that paragraph and then think, oh, is this the movement of the story as a whole? Um, so sometimes that helps me. Love that. Um, and then a question from Dave, which is, how did you find your writing group? Ooh, origin stories. Um, <laughs> it would be really exciting to tell a very fantastical version of this tale, but I will tell that <laughs> the actual version of the tale, which is, um, I met, I met Pip Shun at the Kundiman retreat and I was actually there for poetry and she was there for prose. Um, I remember we talked during the retreat and then afterwards we ended up connecting because we were both in, at the time living in New York. Um, and I remember I was like at my desk work, supposed to be, I was working. <laughs> um, and I, I texted her and I was like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to form a writing group. And she was like, oh, I was just, I was thinking the same thing. So it ended up happening really organically and that we were both looking for a writing group. And then we both like tagged, you know, a, a person or a couple people each and ended up just like spontaneously, not spontaneously, we planned, <laughs> but we ended up meeting um, at someone's apartment. And that was, it just, it was meant to be. It was, it was meant to be, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that the origin story is at Kundiman as well, which is such an incredible yeah. organization. Please check them out. They do amazing workshops and, and readings, fellowships, everything. Um, so a question from Noe, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, which is, is there a form or genre you haven't explored yet that you want to dive into more? Oh, I love this question because I, always hate the form that I'm writing and always want to jump ship and escape to another form, um, which is what I've done with every form that I've tried so far. It's always because I'm like, oh, I can't stand myself in this form anymore. I have to find this new form. Um, 
Yeah, I think I'm really interested in, because I write so much about adolescence and childhood. I think I'm really interested in children's literature and young adult literature. And um, I want to continue to like explore those forms of storytelling. Um, because I realized I was like, oh, I don't think I can kind of move away from writing about, <laughs> about girlhood and adolescence. And there's something about the coming of age story that I will find in any form that I'm in. Um, so the idea of like, oh, writing it then for the people who are in that stage of life, like I would love to, yeah, to explore that. Yeah. Oh, I would love to read you writing in the YA or children's. <laughs> There's so much really interesting just stuff coming out. So many incredible mm -hmm. writers in that genre right now in that form. Um, that's amazing. Um, I realize we are almost at the end of our hour. So I have one more question yes. for you, which is something we actually always end our workshop events mm -hmm. with. Um, uh, and yes, I just saw a question from Muriel. We did answer the question about finalizing stories. Thank you for checking. Um, but the question I always ask, and especially because this evening we are at City Lights, um, I like to call it this practice of like calling friends, absent friends into our mm -hmm. space. And it is essentially book recommendations. Um, what, are you reading? Uh, what did you read while writing Gods of Want? What have you been recommending to people? I was saying earlier, my copy of your book is super battered because I've been tugging it out of a backpack and like thrusting it into <laughs> the places for a while. Um, but can you give us some books to read and, and leave us for the evening? Yeah, I perfect because I have my stack of books right in front of me, which is fantastic. Um, but I, I read a lot of work in translation, um, especially fiction in translation. I find that that's like 99% of what I read. Um, I think it's it shows me what's possible in the storytelling form. And I just, um, yeah, I just love reading <laughs> so many amazing things in translation that are coming out constantly. And I'm like, oh, I have to read. Um, so there's one called Solo Dance by Lee Katomi. Um, who's a Taiwanese writer living in Japan and the book is written in Japanese and was translated into English. Um, and it's part of my like Taiwanese queer canon already. Um, it's so fantastic. And then I have, um, I'm also reading a book called Jawbone by Monica Ojeda, um, which has, I haven't read it yet, but I'm like five pages in and it's already one of the wildest things I've ever read, which is so exciting. It's the sentences are so sprawling and so imaginative and it has elements of horror, which I love. <laughs> I'm like, anytime it's like girls doing things that are really horrifying and horrific, I'm like, yes, I'm here. I'm here for that journey. Um, and then I'm also reading Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung, which is a collection of short stories. And the first story I read was about like a fecal, uh, a, a fecal like being inside of a toilet who like pops up and anything, visceral <laughs> and also horror like that I was very excited I was like hmm a fecal double I'm intrigued um, <laughs> uh, and then I'm also reading At the Edge of the Woods by Masatsugu Ono um, and I'm a big fan of his work and this is his latest book that's come out and it's yeah there's an uncanniness um, to his work and, and mystery that I love so much um, yeah Amazing. I'm so jealous that you're reading Cursed Bunny because I know it's out in the UK, but not in the US yet. Oh yeah, I got it. I got the UK. I got the UK edition. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting. I think it's out in the US in December. Um, there are so many books that I, that have come out in other countries that I'm like, yes, I'm like, please, please. <laughs> waiting, waiting, waiting. Yeah. It's so hard yeah. when you follow like the Booker International Prize because yeah. it's all yeah. not yet accessible. Exactly. Oh, but it's so tragic. So yeah, I empathize. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. I think we are basically out of time. Um, so we'll take this moment to just thank you so much, Kiming, for this conversation, for this book, for Bestiary, for the poems you published on the margins all of those years ago. Um, it's just such a pleasure to hear you talk and think about your work. And um, I'm very excited to just keep reading it in the future. Um, and very grateful to everybody who joined us online this evening, um, whether you were on the West Coast, East Coast, somewhere in between, somewhere internationally. Um, and lastly, thank you so much, as always, to, uh, to Peter, to City Lights for hosting us. I really hope we'll be able to be in person at some point in the future, either at 
City Lights on the West Coast or at the Asian American Writers Workshop in New York City. Um, yeah, thank, yeah, you, thank so you so much. Thank you so much, Lily, for those amazing questions and oh, that sure. lightning round, which was very exciting, thrilling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and for, yeah, and just for the warmth and the energy that you bring into every conversation and every space, it just, uh, yeah, I feel like it is just, it's just this feeling of coming home. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to you um, and to City Lights and AWW. It's, Oh, this is my like kind of last event in a way. And so it feels very, <laughs> it feels very perfect. I'm like, oh, this is a return. Um, Full so, circle. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Very exciting. <laughs> Thank you.